All right, we have slides on the screen. It is a few seconds before two o'clock, so I think we're, and we've got a panel assembled, so we're almost ready to start. Um, this next session is on opportunities for RSEs to secure software development funding, benefits of the ECSE program. Uh, I won't introduce the panel. Um, I will introduce uh, the person who's going to introduce the panel and who's also going to run us through a few slides uh, to set the scene. So I'll hand the floor to Chris Johnson from EPCC. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, thanks Chris, thanks everybody for coming. Um, it's good to see uh, quite a few people here on what was the last session and uh, with some competition from other talks elsewhere. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, I've also got quite a long title as well here. Opportunities for RSEs to secure software development funding, benefits from the EC of the ECSE program. And the, the point of the title really is that there's, um, there's two parts to this. We want to talk about sort of funding in general for RSEs, um, but the, the ECSE program, that's the thing that we run. So uh, that's the sort of example that we'll be using um, uh, but yeah, we, I want to make it as general as, as possible. So what I'm going to do is give uh, a few slides initially um, about, firstly about Archer 2 um, to set the scene. Archer 2 is the, uh, the service that we run and the ECSE is within that. And then I've got a slide or two about the ECSE program, just to tell you what that's about if you don't know. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, ask the, the panel to each introduce themselves um, and then I'm, if you could put any questions up on Slido and we'll keep an eye on those um, and yeah, just be thinking of them as, as I'm talking. Um, we'll, we'll stick with uh, getting, the, getting the questions from there. Um, if you have sort of general questions about Archer 2 and things, that, that's fine, but maybe sort of leave those more towards the end or ask me afterwards, because I want to focus mostly on the RSC part and the, and the ECSEs. Um, but anything that you think is relevant, just put up and we'll, we'll see how it goes. So it is an, an audience-led panel, so the idea is that, uh, that you come up with the questions. Um, I've got a few ideas if, if there aren't, uh, aren't many questions, but that's the sort of last resort, so um, to, you know, do, do come up with things. Um, so, um, I'm from EPCC within the University of Edinburgh. Um, we uh, run Archer 2. The funding comes from uh, UKRI, so that's uh, specifically um, EPSRC and NERC. And the system, the hardware, is provided by HPE, so um, formerly Cray, but uh, they were taken over by HPE, so then um, now uh, just known as Hewart Packer Enterprise HPE. Um, so what is Archer 2? So Archer 2 is the UK National Supercomputing Service. It's based at EPCC at the University of Edinburgh, um, at, out at something called the ACF, just a few miles south of the, the city centre. The service is designed to enable world-leading research for a wide range of uh, research areas. We've got a user base of over 3,000 users, so a big, um, big community. And the original aim was to have a system that was uh, had 10 times the research throughput of its predecessor, um, which was Archer, um, and to provide new capabilities. So I won't run through um, all the codes here, but you can see the kinds of things that, that are done uh, on the system. So um, you, clearly a big one up there is the quantum materials modeling, in particular codes like VASP and CASTEP, um, which run a, a, huge amount of the, use a huge amount of the compute cycles on Archer 2. Um, and then under that, we've got um, some more environmental modeling, so weather and, and ocean, uh, oceanography codes, um, and then next engineering and so on. Um, so you can, you can sort of see what we do there. Okay, so what actually is Archer 2? So it's an HBE Cray X supercomputer. Um, it has 5,860 compute nodes. Each of those compute nodes have 128 cores. So if you do that multiplication, that gives you um, just over three quarters of a million uh, CPU compute cores. Uh, so Archer, its predecessor, had just over 100,000. So that's quite a big increase. Um, the interconnect, the, the, the thing that uh, sends all the messages between the nodes, um, that's the, the HBC, HPE Slingshot 10, um, a very fast interconnect there, which enables um, codes to run, to run very fast on a high number of cores. Um, so the individual compute nodes, AMD, EPIC processors, um, there's basically two, two processors per node, each of them with 64 cores. So that's how you get the 128 cores there each, um, 2.25 gigahertz. 
Um, each of the cores, or most of the, most of the nodes, sorry, have 256 gigabits of, uh, gigabytes, sorry, of um, memory. We have a few that have double that amount of memory, so we've got a few high memory nodes as well. And uh, each of the nodes has 200 um, gigabits per second slingshot interfaces um, to enable the uh, code to go faster, basically. Um, there's various different file systems. So we've got a big uh, work file system, a Lustre file system, um, cluster store. Um, we've got four of those, each with 3.6 petabytes. So that gives you about 14 and a half petabytes in total. Um, there's also a one petabyte um, solid state storage um, system, uh, E1000. I'm told that the F is apparently redundant now, um, so you can <laughs> ignore the F. Um, and that's available via, via Slurm jobs that run on the system. And then we also have a home file system of one petabyte. So uh, a lot of um, file space available as well. So the Archer 2 service itself, that provides comprehensive support uh, for users um, from EPCC and also from HPE. So we have some people in um, the HPE who, who work with, uh, with us and with the users as well. Um, we have an extensive training program that's free to researchers to, to join, and I'm sure some of you here may have come on courses. Um, and they, they range from um, really entry-level courses um, right up to quite advanced courses if, you've, um, if you want to get sort of the most out of your scaling and so on. But there, there's really a wide range, so it's worth looking out for those if you, if you haven't seen them. Um, the main thing I'm going to talk about on the next slide is um, that we have a, the support to employ research software engineers um, via the thing called the ECSE program, which is, is why I'm here. Um, and these can be from within the RSE community um, or within EPCC, and I'll talk about the various combinations of staffing in just a minute. Um, and one of the other important things we do is that we do outreach and engagement activities um, with the public and wider research community. So do keep a, a look out for those. So the ECSE program, so this is the, basically how we provide RSC support. So within EPCC, we have a centralized CSE support team. So these are people employed at EPCC. Um, they are RSEs who support users, answer in-depth queries, install packages, provide documentation, um, and also involved in, in training as well. Um, so they're, but they're people at EPCC. Um, there's further Arch to RSE effort is available via this ECSE program, what we call the embedded CSE program. So the idea here is that um, rather than, so when the service was originally funded, regardless of who was going to run the service, whether that was us or, or somebody else, um, the idea was that some of the effort would be provided to that center who was running it, but there would be a, also a, a larger amount of effort available to the community uh, that people can bid into, and, and that's what the RSE program is. So people can bid in for, to the RSE funding um, via a regular set of calls, so we have three calls per year, and uh, the funding is basically people are, RSEs are funded at 80% FEC. That's a, a, the usual model that's used for, uh, for funding um, research staff. Um, the staff can be at the institute of the PI. So it may be that a PI has some staff in his or her research group um, that they want to uh, get funding for to run a code, to, to work on a code. Um, or you the PI might request staff from the Archer 2 centralized support team, so our staff at EPCC, or it might be that um, you want somebody from a third party institution. Um, so um, we commonly have people from, say, you know, SDFC, UCR, Cambridge, and we've had people, in fact, from, from New Newcastle as well in the past. Um, or it, um, it could be some combination of the above. So you might, for example, have. Um, a local, a, d a domain expert, um, a PR might have a domain expert who knows the code and the domain very well, um, and so they might get some of the effort, but they maybe don't know HPC um, very well, so they're not used to, use, to working on parallel codes. So maybe you, you bring someone in from, um, from EPCC or from STFC or from somewhere else who can, who can work on that bit, so you might have two people working together. Um, so 
it's worth noting that some of these staff do come from RSE groups, so there may even be, there may even be people here who've worked on, on ECSEs, um, or certainly there are probably people here who could work on ECSEs. So if um, you may find that there may be people within your university, PIs who want to get, um, want to work on a code to work on Archer 2, um, and that's a way that you can get involved. Um, and I'm happy to, to talk to anybody who's interested in that. Now, individual projects fund between one and 18 person months. Up until recently, it was one to 12 person months. But um, for the call that we have open at the moment, it's now up to 18 person months. Um, so it's a fairly significant amount of effort um, per project. And that effort is flexible. You don't have to take that within the same number of calendar months. So you could take it over a slightly longer period. And that's useful if you've got other commitments. Um, so if somebody has you know, some commitment that they, they can't remove, um, they could still work on an ECSE at, at a lower rate. Um, or it may be that you have, you know, you might be a, a part-time member of staff, so it's useful to spread the time over longer. Um, so we have 12 FTEs per year available throughout the Archer 2 service. That's a significant amount of effort, okay? 576 person months available for, for the first four years. And, and any extension to, that we would get to Archer 2, we would expect it to, c to continue at the same rate. Um, so that's a, you know, a lot of effort, okay? So we've had seven calls so far. So we've allocated 469 person months across 52 different projects, so a lot of projects. Um, and my sort of little advert is that the eighth call is open right now. So do, you know, do please take a look at that if you're um, interested, if you're an RSC or if you work with RSCs. Um, the closing date for technical evaluations is 4th of October. So you've got about a month uh, to, to look at that. But um, if you go onto the Archer 2 website, um, you'll find lots more about that. So um, what, what can you do? What sort of things can you do in an ECSE? So um, one of the things you could be doing, so, so I should I mention that you know, this is specifically for codes that work on, on Archer 2, okay? I mean, it may be that the, the, what, the work you do would have wider benefits to, to when it, if the code were to run on a, a different system, but the, the funding is specifically for running codes on Archer 2. So, for example, you might be looking at making an algorithmic improvement to an existing code, um, making sure that it's portable. You might be looking at improving the scalability. So you might have a code that already runs in parallel, but it, as, as, as you increase the number of cores, um, the performance goes down. So you might be looking at increasing the, uh, improving the scaling. Um, you might be um, not actually improving the performance of a code, right? Because it's not everything is about improving the performance of a code. You might be making the code more sustainable, more maintainable, more usable. Um, you might be just in making improvements to the code that allow new science to be carried out. Or you may have a code that runs on a different system, but you, you need to do some work to port, to port and optimize it to Archer 2. You might be adding new functionalities to existing code. Um, another thing sometimes people are doing is they've got two codes and they're maybe coupling them. So that's another thing that sometimes comes up. Um, or you maybe have, have a code that runs on a tier two system and you, you just need to do some work to bring it up to the level where it would run on, on Archer 2. The funding cannot be used for scientific research itself, um, but uh, you know, obviously the ultimate goal is that it will aid the research that people are doing. Um, and obviously if you have any, you know, if you have examples of things, you, you, you're not sure if it's, would be eligible, then, then you can speak to us. Now, I, I, I could give a whole hour talk on, on the ECSE or on Archer 2, but that, that's not what this is about. And we've got our, our panel here and uh, hopefully lots of questions. Um, so what I'm going to do now is uh, to I'll introduce the panel. Um, I realize that I'll start the ball rolling because I realize I didn't properly really introduce myself here, but so I'll start and then I'll pass over to the others. So um, yeah, I've been working at EPCC for um, just over 20 years now. Um, I started, uh, my background was physics and maths um, and then particle physics and I sort of moved over to HPC. Um, I, I guess for a, for a while I was um, the, the equivalent of an RSC, we weren't, weren't called that back then, um, and then I sort of moved over into to managing the funding calls, which is, is why I'm, I'm here now. So what I'd like to do now is um, introduce a, a panel and get them each just to, just to say a, a, a few words about them, themselves as introduction. Then we'll have a look at Slido, see if there's any questions, hopefully, hopefully there is, and if, if that one, then we'll just see what, what happens. But this is audience-led, so I want you, you to come up with the questions, me coming up with questions and things is a last resort. So um, if we start with Alison. Okay. Hello, is this switched on? 
Hi, uh, I'm Alison Kennedy. Uh, I work for STFC, as Chris has said. So I'm the outgoing director of the Hartree Centre and currently a strategic advisor um, for STFC. Uh, so Hartree Centre is similar to EPCC in that it's an HPC centre. Uh, it works primarily with industry and it has a big group of RSEs doing similar but differently funded work. Um, I'm, I'm ex-EPCC from about seven years ago, so I was one of the people um, who helped to set up the ECSE programme and I've been involved with it on and off ever since. Hi. I'm Helen Chappell, so I'm a lecturer at the University of Leeds. Um, I suppose quite unusually I'm in the School of Food Science and Nutrition, so we get everywhere. Um, I've been on the panel for about seven years now, so since I was a postdoc actually. Um, I describe myself, I guess, as a computational chemist, um, and I, I guess I was asked to come on to the panel because of the, my sort of biological bent in terms of research. Um, and helping to review those kind of proposals. Hi everyone, um, I'm Neil Chu Hong. Uh, visual description for those of you right up at the back or who have really poor eyesight, um, I'm a 40-something East Asian man and I'm wearing the traditional kind of uh, get up for these conferences of a t-shirt and jeans. Um, I'm also based, like Chris, at the EPCC at the University of Edinburgh where I lead uh, the Software Sustainability Institute. And I guess pertinent for, for this panel, um, I've been um, uh, part of both the advisory committees for the Excalibur program, which is the UK's Exascale software program, uh, and also for COSEC, which is the group at STFC, which supports a lot of the collaborative computational projects, which is another funding scheme for RSEs working in this area, which looks a bit different from ECSE. Um, and I've also advised funders both in the UK and internationally on different ways of structuring software programs. So back over to you, Chris. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. So I'm um, actually looking at uh, some of the questions that come in. Yeah, could you, if you could flip to, to Slido. So we've got quite a few, covers, some quite a few good questions, I think, coming in. So. Okay, so um, I, I guess the first one is probably I can answer because it's specifically about the ECSC program and then the next ones we'll, we'll move on to more, more for the panel. So the first one just says, does the utilization distribution by topic you showed reflect the ECSE approval distribution or is a bunch of other fields using Archer 2 for smaller, but for smaller runs? Didn't see any astrophysics mentioned. So um, yes, so in terms of the utilization distrib distribution by um, you know, I suppose the question then is how does it correlate with the, the ECSE approval distribution? So the, the distribution I showed was obviously for utilization of the machine. Um, it, there are certainly probably, we have, I haven't got the, the stats with me, but I think we have more, um, probably more ECSE projects on sort of computational chemistry and so on than others, and then probably next engineering. So broadly it does. Um, it, it doesn't quite match it because, um, so NERC were not, have not been involved in all of the ECSE calls. So although they were, in, in terms of that utilization list, um, NERC was second in that list, but they would be a little bit further down the list in terms of ECSE approval because they weren't involved in all of the calls just because of the way the funding is distributed between EPSRC and NERC. Um, Referring to astrophysics specifically, no, so astrophysics is not on Archer 2. Um, there's a, astrophysics is um, funded via Dirac, um, which is, I, I also manage the, the resources for, uh, for Dirac as well, um, and astrophysics is within that, so it's, it, at the moment nothing, nothing to do with Archer. We, we may have a very, very small number of astrophysics codes on via, via PRACE, via, via the European project, but Jackie, but um, so astrophysics is not there. Can I ask a follow-up to yeah. that? That, that? That's a really, a really good question from the audience there. I wondered, is there, do, do the panelists think there's a benefit to having slightly more um, approvals from ones which are, uh, aren't using as much time currently on the system to help kind of get more, more codes up to the levels that will make optimal use of the machine? So is there, is there a benefit to skewing the distribution of approvals versus usage? Good question. I guess, Alison, maybe do you want yeah. to go first? Um, I think that's a good question. 
I think what you'd have to do then is evaluate it slightly differently. I think you, you'd have to have some evidence of, you know, is it, is it going to be, if you're going to, to skew your resources that way, how feasible is it? Um, what do you count as success? What percentage of, of projects um, are you prepared to take that are a bit more risky and that may not have a, a guaranteed result at the end of it? So I think it's worth doing, but I think it's something you'd have to discuss um, with EPSERC and, and you'd have to set some boundaries. Yeah. Um, Helen, I mean, do you want to come the on? only thing that I would say about that is that um, obviously we want to encourage new codes onto the onto the machine. We don't just want the the big four or whatever they are to be the ones who are always getting the ECSE projects. Um, so I think smaller codes should be encouraged even within the system that we have at the moment because um, it's not the case that we don't fund them because we do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did, did you did you have any comments yourself, Neil? On that? I think so. mine is, is very similar. I think uh, to, to what's been expressed here, and that I, I, I think one of the challenges here is if you don't if you don't kind of give positive encouragement uh, to new codes, then yes, you sort of see you sort of see things going around in cycles. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it, it's tricky to balance things out when you have a limited number of resources. So, yeah, I think I'm in agreement. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess we'll go on to the, the second, second question. So uh, we need brilliant programs like ECSE, but not just for codes targeting Archer 2. How best can we achieve this? So um, oh yeah, no, interesting one. So um, I can maybe go back the other way this time. So I did, do you want to start? Yeah, yeah. No, this is a really good, a really good question, because I think um, one of the things that's been discussed across other funders is what could you learn from the way that the ECSE program is structured and the way that it operates in terms of encouraging, um, encouraging submissions, technical assessments, uh, and, and sort of the process of, uh, of doing this, and also the size and, and kind of length of funding that you can apply for, whether that could be done for other resources in, in other disciplines, uh, for instance. Uh, I, I know, I mean, maybe this is something you'll come back to, Chris, about the way they do it for Dirac. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think there should be a general encouragement to, to sort of learn from the different programs what works well. So uh, for me personally, I think what works well for ECSE is that it is, it is much more a kind of iterative process to, to, trying, to, to trying to kind of get um, your proposal through. So what I think that might mean for other um, funders and for other architectures, and I know that there are some, some people in the room from, from other countries who've got involvement in their, architect, uh, in their sort of infrastructure, is uh, can that be done? Um, and can those programs be, be produced for other, pe for other people? Um, in the UK, I think the big one that needs to be solved uh, by the UK Digital Research Infrastructure Committee is why do we have this distinction between Dirac and Archer 2 and other, other councils and why are, the, why are the routes all different? Um, but I think that there's historical reasons for that and I would love to see it being as easy for someone from the arts and humanities to apply for time on Archer 2 as it is for someone from Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, but I totally understand why that is the case. We just need to fix it. Yeah. So um, I, I can, I'll maybe comment on Dirac in just a minute, but I'll, I'll let, let you, you speak first, so Helen. I probably don't have anything to, else to add on that, actually. No, that's fine. Yeah. I, think, I think the situation's beginning to change. Um, personally, I think as, as the UK moves towards Exascale, we're going to have far more of a focus on um, can redoing our codes so that they run well with accelerators. I think with the resources we've got in the country, it means that we're going to have to take some decisions about which codes um, we put more of our effort into. And it can't just be, because Exascale is so expensive and it's for the whole country, um, that and all the trickle-down funding can't just be for EPSERC and STFC. So I, I, I think there's a lot of political thinking and a lot that the community can do to help to structure um, where we're going and what we need to do. Um, but also I think it's true that many of the codes that run on Archer 
are not just used by the EPSERC community, they are used by other communities as well. So we shouldn't get into the mindset of thinking this is an EPSERC code, this is an STFC code. In some cases it is, but in other cases it's a generally useful code. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, just to comment, yes, on, on direct. So of the ECSE program, as I described, this is where um, you, you, anyone can bid into it and they can, you, know, you can fund uh, PDRAs and RSEs from, you know, from your, your own groups um, anywhere sort of within the UK, basically. Um, the, the way it works in Dirac is slightly different, is that we have funding calls for computing time uh, usually once per year. And there's a group of, I think it's about six RSCs. I don't know, some of them are in Chris's group, I think. Uh, yes, yeah, so, um, it's about that, or oh, six people maybe across, across the UK. And people can sort of bid in to get, to get their time. But it's, it's, a, it's a fixed group, or a fairly fixed, fixed group, um, people sort of already employed um, within um, Dirac, rather than being able to sort of bid for, for new people. So that's, that's a slightly different model that you, you have there for Dirac. Um, so I'll maybe uh, move on to the next question. So that's a good one. Uh, a bit worried about ECS. Oh, oh, hold on. Yeah, a bit worried about uh, ECSE supporting profs to keep funding their own postdocs to make more spaghetti fortran. How do we mitigate this risk? Right. Okay. Um, I, so I'll, I'll ask. I maybe make a comment to start with. I, I suppose that uh, you know, to some extent, you, we. I, one thing I didn't say actually about the, the ECSE is that. Um, the way that the ECSE proposals are assessed is that we have an independent panel um, that uh, is, is independent of EPCC because we also bid into the effort. So we run the panel, but we're independent of the decisions. And so to some extent, I, I guess it's, it's um, some of the, the things that they assess are um, you, you know, the, the, the software, um, software engineering principles that are being used and sustainability and so on. Um, but, uh, I, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll bring it across, so maybe, uh, um, should we start, hell, it's start in the middle yeah. of something. Okay, yeah. well, I mean, uh, there's nothing principally wrong with wanting to develop the career of one's postdocs and PhD students, I think, but, um, I mean, just expanding on what Chris has said, that we have uh, two major ways in which we look at these proposals, which is about the, the, the science that's going on, the usefulness of the code, what it'll be used for, and then the technical aspects of it about whether it's the right you know, use of, of the code on bringing it onto Archer or whatever. But in that is an assessment of the, the team, the people who are working on that. So we, we do look at, do are the skills there for the particular project that is being um, put before us? So um, in that respect, you have to have the right people in, in your application um, because sometimes when there have been proposals where there's been a, a postdoc or an RSC who's who's really not got the experience to do what they being what is being proposed. It, it can be rejected on those grounds, or we go back and say, well, this doesn't look like the right setup. It's a good project. We like the look of it, but you need to resubmit it. So I think there are some safeguards in there. Um, in terms of just re-employing the same people over and over and over again, which I've never seen happen, actually. <laughs> yeah. um, Alison, yeah. Uh, so, so I'm going to add a story to that. Um, new people who come to Hartree are shown around all the offices. Um, one of the new RSEs um, went into one of the HPC offices and somebody explained to him that he was an RSE that was working on Fortran. So they came out of the office and the new guy said, he was joking, wasn't he? <laughs> um, but, you know, so, so I think that shows partly the view from outside is that we don't need, we don't need RSEs who are experienced in Fortran, but we do, and that's the sort of thing um, that we're, we're, you know, we're, we're stopping spaghetti Fortran. There's some really important codes there. Um, lots of people are still using Fortran, so it's important for the community that these codes are developed in a sustainable way so we don't end up with spaghetti Fortran. We have experts um, and, and professional software developers who are working on any languages and any codes that we think are important for the community. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, and yeah. as someone who started off as a spaghetti Fortran programmer, mm -hmm. um, I, can, I can kind of like sympathize with that. But no, I, I agree with, with um, uh, both of you. It, and, but just I think one, to, one thing to add is, I think a key thing here that's, uh, that's important, I, I, I really hope that other funding programs also do, is that, that aspect of having people who understand what spaghetti Fortran might look like and the signs in a proposal of what might cause spaghetti Fortran or spaghetti Python uh, or spaghetti C and, and having that expertise on the panels that are assessing it and having that separate technical assessment is a really great thing. Um, so, so we need to make sure that RSEs are sitting on these assessment panels because you are the best people to work out whether or not it's appropriate to, to fund this project from a software engineering perspective. And then the other thing here is, is maybe kind of going to where is the future of RSEs and how does it intersect with funding like ECSE is, is how can you show your credentials easily um, on a proposal that you are someone who's not going to be developing um, uh, spaghetti code and that you're someone who's in this as a career as an RSE who works with Fortran, for instance. So can you make that distinction, whether that is through accreditation or track record or um, the outputs that you're producing and being able to, to see them. I think that's really important as well. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, if ECSC applications are for development but not research, does that mean if you were going to write a paper on your code modifications, you would be expected to fund the writing time <laughs> yourself? Um, yes, yeah, so that's, that's a, a, a bit of a tricky one because I mean I'm sorry, I'll start off because it's a sort of slightly slightly procedural about the ECSE I mean that's that's a slightly tricky one to answer because it's a bit obviously it depends a bit on how much I mean at the end of your ECSE uh, project you're expected to write a, a, a final report um, and that would expect that we would expect that that effort comes from within the, the, the proposed yeah, from within the ECSE project um, and that a paper would probably be in, included in in that, um, but obviously it, it depends. If that if that paper takes a lot more effort, then yeah, I guess that effort probably would at the moment have to be found from somewhere else. Um, but it, it's yeah, it, that's a, a bit of a tricky one. I don't know if the panel have any. I mean, I say, I say it's slightly it's slightly procedural with respect to the ECSE, but I don't know if the panel have any. It seems quite similar to most research grants anyway really that the paper comes a long time after the <laughs> grant yeah. is finished so yeah but that's not reassuring but still yeah i think it's pointing to a bigger research culture problem of when do we are, are we given sufficient time to write the papers whoever we are whether we're, whether we're a postdoc or an rse um i think yeah i think that's a, a a much wider problem that we need to address and having sympathetic supervisors and PIs and, uh, would help a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, okay, I, I, if nobody has any more comments on that. So what's the typical acceptance rate for ECSE applications? Um, I, I, I certainly have that statistic on, a, on a, um, a spreadsheet which I could find very quickly. I can't remember what it is. It's, Thirty percent. Yeah, maybe. Yes, I don't know what it is overall, but it's probably the last few panels. It's been about thirty, thirty percent. That sounds about right. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll try and try and look that look up the exact number because obviously I'll, I'll have that somewhere. But that's about it. Which I think is yeah. That's so that's not you know not a, a bad rate. I think um, compared with some calls, you know, I've I've heard of some um, you know calls where it's less than ten percent. Right. So. Um, yeah, by, by comparison, that's much better than the software-specific calls from, from EPSRC uh, and uh, better, I think, than responsive mode as well. Yeah, so. exactly. and I think the other thing to add, Chris, is that um, there's fairly frequent closing dates. The panel tries very hard to give constructive feedback um, and many people do reapply and are successful the second time. Yeah. Yeah, I'd also add that it's um, on an individual panel, there isn't an absolute amount of money yeah. that we have to spend. So if you get, you know, however many stellar proposals in one particular round, um, more can be funded on one round than on another. 
Um, so I think that's worth bearing in mind. There's, there's no 30% for each. Um, <coughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's an important point. Yeah, I mean, we, each, each call, because the program's quite long, um, it means that, you know, it doesn't mean that we, we have, have to spend a certain amount at each panel or that we're really restricted. So we can look at the quality of the, the proposals that, that come in. Um, so, yeah, thanks for that. So uh, another, another good, good comment here. My institution and, and school facility will veto applications for funding if they do not align with strategy and topics of interest. Oddly, NERC not often interested in software engineering. I'm also not recognized as an academic and need coaching in proposal writing. Who will help me? Um, so an interesting one. So I'll, I'll maybe, I, I don't want to interject too much, but one comment I can make with regard to the, the ECSE is that one thing that we can do to help is um, if you get in touch early, then we can often um, e either give you some help. Well, what we can't do is sort of do too much sort of proofreading a proposal because we also bid in as well, so that would be a bit of a conflict of interest. But we can give pointers, and one of the things that we can do is we can point people um, to maybe colleagues within your own institution who've had a successful ECSE proposal who can help you. So we can put you in touch with people. Um, but anyway, that, that's, that's quite specific to, to, to the ECS even in general. But um, I, I can't remember which side we, maybe Neil, Neil, I can't remember which side we started from last time. I don't time. know. Um, mm. uh, that's a real cry for help. And I, I really um, empathize with the person who's asked this question. Um, there's some things maybe to, to lighten the mood and hopefulness for you a little bit. Um, I am seeing that NERC is getting increasingly interested in software engineering and the quality of, of codes being developed under NERC grants, um, both through specific calls and also trying to, trying to get more of this recognized. But you are up against the, the peer review system and the people who sit and review your applications. Um, and there still needs to be work done to, to kind of uh, combat that. Um, also, as someone who, who did not go up the academic path but, uh, but was applying for funding, I, it seems to be really random as to whether or not your university or your department will, um, will support this. I was lucky. I had a department that supported me in going for funding, and I had a university who were ambivalent in, in letting me kind of switch and, and apply for funding. So that was, that was all I needed. Um, and perhaps one of the things I know that I've done with other people is simply uh, sharing the fact that other people in other universities are being allowed to do this in the position that you are in may help you persuade your own university that there's a benefit to this because there's nothing um, there's nothing more that a university loves than thinking that they're missing out on money um, so that's a really good driver and uh, I, I'm happy to kind of like if you want to catch me in the in the break after this um, but it, yeah it's it's a real problem I, I've heard from a lot of people who basically said because I'm not in uh, recognized as an academic who can put in funding, uh, my university is not allowing me to lead bids, and that, uh, that has to change. Um, um, am I right in thinking, Chris, that we're still split so that some of the money is specifically NERC, some of the uh, time we give is specifically to NERC? So it's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. changed a little bit. So um, for Archer 2, um, NERC had a specific amount of, of person mm. months that they, um, they wanted yeah. to award, and that was, that was to do with an agreement at the UK RI, RI level that, that yeah, we, we weren't particularly part of. But, um, so they had a certain number of person months, so, so it was sort of se separated out in that way. And between the two research councils, they, they thrashed out which, which was actually NERC and which was EPSSC and which might have been 50-50. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was done like that. Mm. And as it is at the moment, the NERC, the NERC funding is, is finished for, for this call, but they may be, they may be more later. So okay. it, was, it was split quite formally. Okay. It was less formal under Archer. I wasn't sure, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, if you had okay. anything. Um, I could be wrong, but my understanding was that the research investigator um, title was introduced, so that would cover people who were applying for funding who weren't academics. So I've certainly seen that used at Edinburgh. I've seen it used at other universities. So it might just be a question of positioning yourself. Um, specifically for ECSE, if you're applying for that, I think one of the things to remember is it is a project. It's not just about the technical work you want to do. If you're putting in a good case, you have to think about um, you know, what's your work plan, 
Um, can you be realistic about how much you're going to get done in that time? What are you going to do to publicise the work you've done? So, so putting in um, a proposal to that is, is slightly different, and I've thought for many people, if you're allowed to put that in and you can put that in, it gives you some experience which you can then use to go forward to put in a larger grant, perhaps to a bigger call. Yeah. Yeah, so, got it. Ilona, yeah. so yes, so we run the observer programme, which allows people to observe the actual panel meetings. Um, it's a really good opportunity to understand what the panel are looking for, what they see as positive things in applications and what are maybe things that can be improved on. You're about to open one very soon, I think. So yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, so in fact, there's an observer's call running alongside the, the ECSE call that we're, that we're running at the moment. So if you're interested in coming along at the panel to see, <laughs> to see what you know, these people discuss, then, um, then just you know, do apply for that. I think that's been very beneficial. I think we have had observers who've then gone on to put in ECSE proposals. Or, or proposals to other calls, right, which is, has been useful. And there's no issue with you being NERC related for that? No, no, no. Um, yeah, what was the, oh, the, yeah, the other, I was going to add one comment there as well. And the other thing is that if, if you are finding that you, have a, you, you want to put in an ECSE proposal or want to be involved in one in some way, and, that, and you find that your uni, own university is being a barrier, it's worth getting in touch with us because sometimes what we can do is then point out that, that your university has had other ECSE proposals accepted um, and that has actually, that sometimes convinced them then, because we've even had one or two where they, they've looked at the terms and they say, oh, maybe there's something, we, you know, we just have one simple terms document which, which has to be agreed, and maybe they don't like something, and then we say, ah, but actually, you know, a, your department across the road has, has already accepted three proposals, and then they go, oh, okay, it must be okay then. It, it, it does help, so uh, just get in touch. So, um, okay. So um, next one is, yeah, could ECSE fund the development of training for the use of an HPC package is if it was targeted at using the software at extreme scale? So um, yeah, that, um, that would be a, a sort of change to the, to the remit at the moment. Um, I, can maybe, I'll make, I can make some comments again from the ECSE point of view, but I'll come to the panel first. So if we... If we I start at this end. I don't right, have sorry, any what's control. the specific question? So the specific question yeah. is, could ECSE fund the development of training for use of HPC packages? So if it was targeted at software at the stream scale, so, so basically could it, yeah, could it involve, could it be used for, for development of training? Yeah. Probably as a follow-on to an ECSE, I think. I mean, goes back to one of one of the things that I don't like to see in ECSE applications is people who suggest that with three months funding, their software is going to be so miraculously transformed that the entire world is going to pick it up and use it <laughs> without there being any training or outreach. So, so perhaps something there that says, you know, when we've done this work, it, it seems a shame to fund something if, if you don't then have funding to tell people what you've done um, and to encourage people how to use it. So perhaps it would be fo a follow-on, perhaps it would be a project in two parts where, um, where there's an evaluation of when this work's done, what can we do um, in terms of supporting the community and outreach. Um, I've seen that done in other countries and I don't think the ECSE does it at the moment. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if you mean it in the way I've interpreted the question, but um, you know, the, the team that you put together for your ECSE proposal sort of allows you to get some training in there as well, because you can have um, experts in a particular code who you're collaborating with, who are co-eyes on your um, proposal and we fund travel to go and see people and work with people so I, I'm not sure this is quite what you meant but um, in terms of training for the person doing the ECSE project uh, which is not what no, you interpreted it bad. as um, there sort of is some wiggle room in there to it, it depends on the team that you put together um, to do that mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can't speak for the ECSE program and what they can or can't fund, but if, if I was able to make a change, I, I kind of think of this in the same way that uh, software, software engineering isn't just about the writing of the code, it's the writing of the documentation, it's the writing of the training materials. So I, I actually would go further and say if there isn't a training component, 
in an ECSE proposal? Why isn't there? Um, and I think that would go a long way to improving the access to a lot of the codes beyond the traditional um, user base. Uh, but yeah, I, I think the other thing that's really interesting is the, uh, th that you've raised is how do we make sure that people who are funded, um, particularly as more junior RSEs on um, ECSE grants, whether there's the opportunity for them to access training as well. Because mm -hmm. I think that's something that other funding councils are starting to look at much more. I've seen it quite a lot on some of the BBSRC software calls that reviewers are really looking to see what's the, what's the personal development of the, of the postdocs and the RSEs that are part of those grants. Um, and, and yeah, it would be great to see that happening on other calls as well. And in terms of writing documentation, frequently there is a work package in the ECSC yeah. proposals that have that in there. Yeah. Um, and, and have some form of dissemination attached to the, the, the work that's going to take place. Yeah. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I guess there's quite a number of ways that you can interpret, interpret the, the question, but um, certainly, in, so just to pick up on also what, what Neil said there, um, one of the things that we, the, the panel do take account of is if you, if, if you have a more junior member of staff um, there's an understanding that may, maybe that the project will need a bit more effort. It might need one, you know, an extra person month if the member of staff is more junior than, than perhaps if they were more experienced. And also it looks at the, um, the, uh, the experience of the team as a whole. So it may be that you've got uh, somebody who's quite junior who's working on the code, but then you might have, there might be two co-eyes, for example, who, who can give a lot of help. Um, so that's all... Uh, that's all um, uh, you have know, taken into into account. So that, that's to that's that's looking at it from the point of view of the training of, of a person sort of thing. But um, yeah. Okay. So um, next question um, was how do we find guidance for applicants? What makes a good quality ECSE application? So um, I, I, I will um, just say something about the uh, what we do from the point of view of running the program there, and that is that there are some there are webinars and things that you can find online which which do try to help and give some pointers. And I think f further down the you can't, can't see on there, but further down the list, I think somebody's pointed out that there's uh, the webinars are, are worth looking at. Um, and also, we can put you in touch with people from your own institution who might be willing to to share their proposal um, and so on. Uh, but the more general question of what you know, what what makes a good ECS quality ECSE app, SE application. Um, oh, maybe I'll, I'll turn to the panel first. So uh, there's, you've there's seen. A hand up. Oh, there's a hand up. Yes, go on. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. I I just wanted to contribute as someone who's just finished an ECS ECSE proposal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I managed four RSEs, and one of my RSEs did the work. And as part of that, there was the dissemination. They've actually written documents and contributed to the Archer Docs page as part of the dissemination. But there's a wider community interested in the software, and there will be a workshop next May that refers to the Archer. And in fact, right now in my university, there is a workshop going on that is also referring to that work on Archer. So that software is now available for scientists where it wasn't available, and it's a wider UK community benefiting from it. So the workshop part of it is the dissemination and, and some form of training. Mm -hmm. Excellent. No, thank you. That's very. It's really good to hear. So thank you. Um, I guess yeah. one one question here. So would would you ever go as uh, as far as some other funders, um, which is to publish the full proposals of successful um, proposals online? Yeah, that's a that's a, a tricky one. I mean, I. I I guess it would it obviously. I mean, it's so I suppose just to ask, to ask a question about is that is that done? Um, is that Done up front, or is it, or do they are people asked whether they're, asked they're up front? So, um, uh, the uh, one funder that does this, uh, for instance, is uh, the CZI Essential Open Source uh, Software for Science program. But applicants are, are specifically told up front that the applicant, in fact, they go further, all applications are available yeah. online, not just successful ones. But it's 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 um, opt uh, well, it's not opt in, it is a part of the um, process is that you, you know that that's going to happen. Okay. Um, and it's obviously not the personal details, it's the, yeah, it's just, the scientific yeah. and that's, technical That's an plan. interesting one. I think we would have to, we, I mean, something we should consider and you know, something that we should look at and discuss also with, with EPSRC in particular. Um, 
Because one of the things I should say, and it sounds a bit like sort of passing it back, but one of the things that, that we try to do as much as possible is because we work, you know, the funding comes from UKRI and most of it from EPSRC, we try to use as much of their panel procedure and sort of processes as possible in terms of eligibility and the way the panels run and so on. So we would obviously have to discuss that with them and, and to see what they do. But then in other cases, we've, we have sort of led things like we did we, the observers program we, yeah. we've done and then others have sort of, uh, you know, sort of you know, wanted, to, wanted to do it as well. So, I mean, that doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean we, we, can, we could be the first to do it in, in, within the PSRC maybe. And it definitely encourage people that, that are, are looking for more guidance to go on the observers program because I, I wish there was that for, for other funding um, calls. I think uh, personally, the most I've learned for how to do a good application um, is two things. One is talking to people who've put in other successful applications. And the second was uh, being able to start um, reviewing applications uh, and sitting on panels and just seeing how people read applications in different areas uh, was really, really valuable for, for understanding what makes a good application. Because what makes a good application for an ECSE project is not the same thing as makes a good application for uh, a NERC research grant. It's not the same thing that makes a good application for an EPSRC research grant. Yeah, I mean, so from my point of view, over seven years on the panel, I'd say the first thing you have to sort out is that it is technically sound, right? And so the way you start going about that is by contacting EPCC first and uh, having a conversation. So everything you propose technically needs to be doable, right? So that's sort of hurdle number one. And then I'd say the second thing, which is probably the same for all grants in, in a way, is that the, the science or what you want to do should sound really exciting, right? So I can remember a couple of the ECSEs that I've read where I thought, wow, this is amazing, okay? So this is really interesting stuff. So um, bear in mind, panel members are from all different walks of life. So I use packages more than I write my own code, but that's not the same for everybody. Um, I will get proposals to review, which um, are codes I've never used, and I don't know much about them. Um, so I think you need to be writing these proposals in, um, you know, not a play school way, but in a way that's easily understandable to your average intelligent scientist, okay? Um, and, and make it sound really exciting stuff. That would be my suggestion. <laughs> yeah. uh, absolutely agree. I think what I would add to that is um, you need a plan. If you're going to apply for money, you have to say exactly what you're going to do, um, how you're going to assess how it's going and what progress you're making. Um, and I think another question that often comes up, at least in the ones I've been on, is if it's a code that has many other funding sources, um, why are you asking ECSE to fund the particular part um, that you're asking them to fund? And how does that fit with bigger community development or development in your group? Um, so it doesn't look as if you're just putting in uh, random applications for money to do interesting things with your code. Yep. Okay. Thanks. So um, we've, we've only got a, a few minutes left, so um, I'll, but I'll, we'll get through as many as we can. So if next question was, if funding is for ARCH2 specific work, which is a service with a timetable of several years, is there a conflict with the more general aims of the RSE movement, i.e. to create sustainable software over a much longer time scale? Um, so I guess I'll go to the panel first. I think, uh, Alison, I think I can't remember which side we started from last time. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's a conflict. Um, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, most of the codes in use in, in the UK have been around for years, decades, um, sometimes longer. So, so there is that element of continuity there. Um, and I think we need, to, we need to keep the codes up to date. Um, so, so to me, it's, it's the professionalization, the emphasis on engineering that's going to allow us to, to continue to evolve these codes um, so I don't think there's a particular problem there, although, of course, we should be open to, to new codes coming along. There are occasions on which writing a completely new code may be the right thing to do, but you need to be able to gradually wean your user community off the previous one. Mm -hmm. That's a different issue. 
Uh, I don't have anything to add. No. Right? Yeah, yeah, you've answered it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the next question then was, how can other RSE teams get involved in working for ECSE projects? Um, so um, I, I'll maybe say something in just a minute about how we look at that from the ECSE point of view. Um, but maybe if the panel have any comments first. So um, maybe start in the middle. I don't know, Helen, have you? Um, hard to say, really. It depends on how you all network together, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't have any specific ideas on that one. Alison? Not really. I mean, I think the RSE community is far better networked now. I think it then means that if you're an RSE team, um, there's a whole range of, of funding um, opportunities open to you. So yeah. that, would be, that would, would be all I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess the only thing I, I could add to that is is perhaps look and see uh, what are what are the kinds of science being done um, on machines like Archer Two or or on the Tier Two centres, and are there any of the researchers who are who you're collaborating with or who are at your institution um, who are doing work that intersect with those areas, and see whether or not they're interested in collaborating and and looking to put in a proposal. I think I think it's the same as any. Um, new collaborations. Yep. One of the things I could add is that what sometimes has happened is that where you've had RSE groups within an institution who are quite general, um, those RSE groups themselves have actually then gone out to the, to the sort of academic departments in the university and sort of you know, and spoken to them about the possibility of getting involved in an ECSE project. So, um, so if you're an RSE or a part of an RSE group that wants to get involved, then if you, know, if you sort of you know, look, look for people within your own institution who might be, might be looking for you to help them, and then you can sort of come to us about an ECSE project. So that, um, you know, so, so I, I would say, I mean, you know, nothing's ruled out really, just you know, sort of, you know, just spread the word um, and, and you know, try to, get, try to sort of get, get a group together. Um, I think all I would add there, Chris, is that uh, most academic collaborations come about from people moving institution or, or working with people they worked with on their PhD, and it should be exactly the same with RSEs. You all know a lot of people um, use your networks. Yep. What, one other thing there is, um, I know that a number of the RSE groups that are represented at this conference have been very successful at, at finding this collaboration simply by running training at their own institution, because if there's one thing that gets people out and, and to, to start talking to you, it's running the right sort of training for them. Um, so it, uh, quite often it's either general training on, on kind of just uh, working with software, or it might be something a little bit more specialist to look at perhaps, yeah, targeting your university's uh, research computing service uh, that will help you identify those people. Yeah. So um, I think that, that we've basically pretty much run out of time. So I think the last few comments that you can see there um, probably are more sort of comments and questions. So uh, yeah, absence of astrophysics is because that's within the STFC remit. So it's just not part of Archer 2. Maybe these will all come together later, but at the moment it, it's, it's separate. Um, somebody watched a good Archer YouTube on ECSC applications, recommend, I, yeah, I would recommend you, you look at those too, so that's good. Um, and then somebody else also mentioned that there are videos available um, of an Archer 2 webinar. So do go onto the Archer 2 website. If you look at the training section, you'll see, just do a search for ECSE, you'll see some um, videos of webinars given by us about the ECSE, but you'll also find some webinars from people who've done ECSEs who've then given a webinar. So do have a really good look through there, and there are case studies and, and so on. Um, so I think that's come, come to the end of the question. So um, that's that's great. So thank thank you to the audience for um, for providing so many questions, really good questions. And I'd like to thank uh, my three colleagues here. Thank you very much. Thank you.